of the most important elements to a good and classic slasher film is not just a memorable, badass, and formidable foe that is the killer, but also the opposite end of the spectrum, the lone survivor, the final girl. And as many final girls as we love in this genre, amongst there are dozens that we could talk about being our favorites, it's very easy to forget that there are plenty of horror films out there that have an awesome final guy. So today we're gonna talk about my top 10 favorite final guys. And this video topic was presented and chosen by my patrons over on Patreon. If you guys don't know what that is, please check the link down below in the video description. It is my crowdfunding source. It's where you get some extra content over there. I try to do some exclusive of live streams and Q&As. I give early access to my videos when I get ahead of the game. And once a month, and like this month, we'll have twice a month, I actually let my patrons choose topics for videos. So if you wanna join in on the fun or just find a really fun way to help contribute to this channel, please consider checking that out. So as far as my rules, on this list, my top 10 final guys. It's really not all that complicated and it's nothing I'm gonna go all that strict with, but being a final girl or a final guy, obviously you are the last surviving character of the film, you are the sole survivor, you're the last person who is up against the villain, and traditionally you're the one who takes down the villain. Now there's only gonna be, I think, two exceptions to the lone side of things. Now there are gonna be some movies on this list, I believe two of them, where there is other characters that survive to the end, but those characters are all but absent from the third act or absent from the climax. We've had plenty of classic slashers do that where after the evil is vanquished, surprise, surprise, there's some more surviving characters. I mean, the original Scream is a good example of that. But these are the characters that are the ones you remember the third act and the climax for. These are the ones that are the face of the movie in one way or the other. And let me just go ahead and rip the Band-Aid off now. Jesse from Nightmare on Elm Street 2 and Tommy Jarvis did not make this list. Look, I know Jesse is one of the more famous and even in previous decades, infamous final guys of all time, not one of my favorites. And Tommy Jarvis, that's the one I probably will get a little bit of shit for, but look, I'm not a gigantic Friday the 13th fan. And while I do enjoy part four and part six, part four is actually probably my favorite or second favorite of the franchise. Tommy Jarvis, good character, not one of my favorites. Just, just not one of my favorites. It's okay. We'll live. Coming in at number 10 for me is gonna be Alex from the original Final Destination, played by Devin Sawa. Now, Final Destination is a great horror franchise. It was a really cool, unique idea. It's got all the flavor of a slasher, but there's no masked killer going after you. It's just death incarnate. And all of these accidents, like Rube Goldberg machines, became a really cool device to do a really nice franchise with. I'm looking forward to whenever the sixth film is released, hopefully next year. But Alex, played by Devin Sawa, is the one who kicks off the events of this first film. He is the one that sees the premonition, the one that inadvertently gets everybody off of the plane before it explodes, and is also the one who starts to piece together Death's plan and systematically tries to save everybody else yet again and fails miserably for the most part. But while there are three surviving characters by the end of this film, he is the face of this movie. And he honestly would have been higher if they didn't kill him with a fucking brick off screen in the second film, but I've always been a big fan of Devin Sawa, especially when I was younger. Movies like this and Idle Hands are absolute classics to me. He's a really good character. He's a strong character. He's kind of, not really a nerd, but he's on the outskirts a little bit and kind of has to rise to the occasion, gets the girl, and also becomes friends with his bully by the end of it. How many more victories can one guy have? Now really quick before we move into the top nine, while it is very difficult for all these characters to face off against evil itself and survive to the end, it's even more difficult to survive against the spammers and the hackers and the identity thieves out there. So make sure that you are safe surfing online by using the sponsor of today's video, Aura. Have you ever Googled yourself and been shocked to find out how much of your personal information is just readily available for anybody to find on these public listing sites? Just recently I looked at my own name and I found not only my current address and phone number, but all of my phone numbers and addresses within the past 15 years. Beyond that, are you absolutely sick of constantly receiving spam phone calls to where you don't even answer your phone anymore? If you take me off your listing right now, I will not look for you, I will not pursue you. But if you don't, I will look for you. I will find you, and I will, well, you know the rest. The unfortunate reality is that data brokers make a fortune selling all of your personal information to robocallers, spammers, or anybody that's willing to pay for more information about you. 
including where you live. Well, the sponsor of today's video, Aura, is here to help by identifying these data brokers that are leaking your information and even submitting opt-out requests on your behalf. Legally, these data brokers are required to remove all of your personal information that they have if you ask them to, but they make it extremely difficult for you to ask. So why not just let Aura do all the heavy lifting for you? Aura also protects you while surfing online with parental controls, antivirus, VPN, password management, and even identity theft insurance, all located on one app for an affordable price. So let Aura do all the hard work of keeping you safe while surfing online so that you can continue your day-to-day -day life with peace of mind. You can either allow people to continue to exploit and profit off of your personal information, or you can go to aura.com slash Cody Leach or click the link in the video description to start your two week free trial. That's aura.com slash Cody Leach or click the link in the video description for a 14 day free trial. And thank you to Aura for sponsoring today's video. Coming in at number nine is going to be Casey from The Faculty. And this is played by Elijah Wood. This is one of, if not my favorite, of Robert Rodriguez's films. If you get nothing else out of this list, it's Watch The Faculty. And if you haven't watched The Faculty, why the hell haven't you watched The Faculty? It's been out for like 20 something years. Nonetheless, The Faculty, to me, one of the best horror films of the 90s. This had all of the potential, all the ingredients to be just as successful of a franchise as Scream, but for whatever reason, it just didn't quite take off. Had a great cast full of a bunch of up and comers, many of which went on to do a lot of great things and be in a lot of big franchises. Elijah Wood has always been a mainstay in Hollywood. And uh, the whole alien invasion, invasion of the body snatchers take on high school was just such a cool and fresh idea. A great soundtrack, but Casey, the character himself, is kind of the embodiment of the nerd rising up to be the hero. You know, he's the one that the movie opens up with him getting his balls caved in in a fucking flagpole. I mean, he, the high school basically told this guy to go fuck himself, okay? If there's a totem pole of hierarchy in high school, he is underneath the totem pole. But you get him in the situation where he's with the jock, he is with the, the bad boy, the one who's been held back three or four years, the head cheerleader, the gothic chick, all the different stereotypes, all of the different caricatures of high school teenagers and he rises to the top by the end of it to be the one who not only has to face the alien basically by himself but figure out a way to outsmart it and to finally vanquish the evil and save his high school and inadvertently planet earth and he's just a badass character because you really don't see any reason aside from his smarts in the first and even second act why he would be the one to rise to the occasion but in the best horror and slasher movies, they always flip that on its head, put somebody like that that has never really risen to their potential against this seemingly undefeatable evil, and then you watch that potential come out. So I love his character, I love this movie, I wish we could, would've got more of them, but even as a standalone, it's one of the classics of the 90s, and Casey's an awesome final guy. Number eight, we have Jim Halsey from The Hitcher, played by C. Thomas Howell. The Hitcher is absolutely one of my favorite films of all time. Another one that I wouldn't necessarily say is under underrated because everybody that knows it loves it but it's underknown it's underseen it's one of those films that I like to broadcast and shine a spotlight on so after you're done watching the faculty be sure you pick up the hitcher maybe one day we'll get an actual legit blu-ray but the hitcher is one of those classic road action horror films where you have Rutger Hauer as might as well be nameless faceless evil he does have a name but he's just this unstoppable force that suddenly is in Jim Halsey's life on the road in a fish out of water situation where he has no idea where to turn, who to go to, or where he's even at. And this guy just will not let him escape. Every time he feels like he has gotten out of John Ryder's path, he is right back into it. Everybody that he brings into the situation to try to help himself ends up getting killed or things just get exponentially worse. And the situation just continues to rise. And all throughout the movie, there's this ongoing theme with his character about rising to his potential, about kind of almost accepting manhood to a certain degree, because he's taken this car to, to travel for money, and there's, there's certain lines of dialogue, there's certain conversations that let you know that he's maybe somebody that hasn't quite been pushed out of the nest quite yet, and this situation and John Ryder absolutely just catapults him out of the nest. And so him having to face all of the death and destruction in his wake and in John Ryder's wake, and finally getting to the point where even after he seemingly has escaped the situation and John Ryder has been caught and everything is done, 
he will not rest until he knows that Ryder is dead, until the bullet goes into his head, and he prefers to be the one to put the bullet there. So one of the best Final Guy characters as far as just a character arc, and just a change from who he was in the first frame of the film to who he is as the credits roll. Number seven, you're gonna need a bigger list. We've got Brody from the original Jaws. And yes, you do have Hopper who is alive at the end, but like a number of these movies, he, the other character, the supplementary Final Guy, is absent from the climax of the film. Jaws is still one of the greatest movies of all time. That's something that is just absolutely timeless. It doesn't matter how far away we get from the day that this movie was released, the movie is still effective, it's still gripping, it's still responsible for people being scared to go in the water, scared to go in the ocean, uh, deathly afraid of sharks in general. And Brody at the heart of all of this is a character who from the beginning is just trying to save the people in his town. He is the sheriff and as soon as he sees that there's evidence of a shark attack. He keeps having to fight against the dickhead mayor throughout the entire first act of the film to try to get the beaches closed for financial reasons. He won't do it. Keeps playing off the threat of this great white shark. More and more people die. And then it becomes a hunt film to where you have Quint, Hooper, and Brody all out on the ocean trying to not only locate this killer great white, but also figure out ways to trap it, ways to extinguish it and every single thing that they try fails because the shark is just so much bigger and smarter than anything that Quint especially has ever come across. You get to the third act where the shark jumps basically onto the boat, Quint goes bye-bye, Hooper is seemingly dead or at least you know forgotten down below in his little shark cage and it's all up to Brody as this ship is sinking like you can almost feel like the ticking time element is just visualized by him sinking deeper and deeper into the ocean being that as soon as he's in the water you're basically fucked you got like a minute and a half to kill this shark otherwise you're going to be fish food and the way that they just builds to that moment the way that steven spielberg builds to all of that and him finally having to rise up and be the one to take this fucking thing out now that quint is gone and shoot this thing in the mouth, that great classic line of open wide, you son of a pow, and then just the explosion, and then the, the elation on his face, and the way that, that Roy Schreider just absolutely nails that moment of excitement and victory. Again, just caps off one of the greatest movies of all time, and for a character arc of somebody that is out of his element, does not have the expertise of the other two characters he is with, but is the one that has to rise up and take this fucking beast down, He's a great character. Number six is gonna be Arkin from The Collector and The Collection. Maybe one day we'll get The Collected and we can wrap this all up and he can rise even higher on this list. But The Collector and The Collection are two of the best one-two punches in recent horror history. I think that The Collector is, to me, like the, the next in line to be the great horror icon as if we've had very many in the last 10 to 15 years, like Jigsaw is basically the only one that's prominent. The Collector had all the potential to be there. We just need the series to be a little bit more well-known. Maybe that third film will get there if we ever get it. But Arkin to me is a great final guy because a lot of the same reasons as the other ones, but he really has to change as a character as far as his motivations throughout these two films. And even just in the first film, He's a thief. He's breaking into this house of these people that he works for to get money to give to these mobsters, these people that he's in debt with to save his family. So you get somewhat of an understandable motivation there to keep you on his side enough. But he's not a good guy. He's a bad guy. He's a, he's a shithead. So he's in this place trying to rob this house, this family that has taken care of him. And the night that he chooses to go there, somebody else is in the house and it's the collector and he has set traps all over the house and he is slowly hunting down and torturing this family. And so the first half, maybe even two thirds of the movie, he's just concerned with getting the fuck out of there. And it's not until he sees that the little girl is still in the house that he decides to go back into the lion's den and take down the collector to save this little girl. And you get to the second film where he was originally collected by the end of it, which is a great ending to that first film, and now he's been found, he's been let loose, and the collector has is, is ramped up his carnage even more. And then he is thrust back into the path of the collector, again, kind of against his will. It's not his motivation to go in and save this girl that has been collected and to take down the collector once again, but uh, he, he's brought in against his will with this rich guy that wants to save his daughter with all these mercenaries, all these badasses who are supposed to be, you know, much more capable for the situation than Arkin is. He's kind of like the Ellen Ripley of the situation. 
And by the end of it, he's the one who survives, continues to outsmart the collector, and that great ending stinger of the collection where he actually hunts down the collector after he has escaped and collects his ass. Like, even if we don't get a third film, that's a fucking badass way to end this story, to end those two characters. He's a cool-ass final guy because maybe better than any of them, just completely flipping the script on the killer and making the killer his bitch, Arkin does it better than anybody. Number five, we got Charlie Brewster from Fright Night and Fright Night Part Two. Fright Night, one of my favorite vampire films of all time, one of my favorite horror films of all time. The sequel, very underrated, underappreciated, and very underseen sequel. The full movie's on YouTube, by all means. If you've never seen it, please go check it out, especially if you're a fan of the original. And he is in a really interesting situation to where he knows there's a vampire living next door, but nobody will believe him because why would you? You know, this, this kid's crazy. This kid's having nightmares. This kid's paranoia. He's, he's looking for attention. And when you have somebody like Chris Sarandon playing the vampire and is so charming and has that kind of sexual allure to him, that seduction, every single person, whether it's male or female, is kind of lost in his luster and is just like, this guy's cool as fuck. He can't be a vampire. Shut the hell up, Charlie. But throughout the movie, slowly, one by one, everybody is convinced, namely Peter Vincent, his idol, his TV uh, host idol, who's supposed to have all the expertise of vampire killing, but is kind of a fraud kind of a fake and now he has to rise to the occasion they two team up together to finally take down peter vincent and then the second film is kind of the same thing only charlie is the one who is lost in the uh, the luster lost in the allure to the vampire and so peter vincent kind of has to do the convincing and their their roles are kind of reversed in that movie but great character really fun movies both of them and uh, just a really enjoyable character arc of again seeing somebody kind of rise to the occasion and do everything he can to save all of his friends except evil ed oh you're so cool brewster number four is going to be mike from the phantasm franchise now i know some of you are not fans of this franchise every time i put anything phantasm related high on a list for me i always get the objectors that are very loud look I love this franchise. It's one of my favorites. It was a big part of my uh, my childhood. And I really only defend the first two films. So we don't need to argue about three, four, and five, although Mike is still the figurehead of those movies as well. So whole five film franchise with one consistent final guy. But the first two films, especially the first one, Mike is a young kid. You know, he's a young teenager. He is orphaned. He only has his older brother taking care of him. And he realizes that there's something sinister going on in his town at this mortuary. And very similar to Charlie Brewster, even characters like Andy Barkley that we have yet to discuss, he is a, a situation where nobody believes him. Nobody understands what his paranoia and what his mania is about. Nobody believes there's some evil, supernatural, sci-fi, tall man hanging out at the fucking mortuary. Just go to sleep, kid. You're having nightmares. And where he stands out among a lot of those characters is the level of balls that this kid has to where he sees this fucking dude pick up a casket by himself and put it into the back of his hearse. He sees these evil little Jawas. He sees these fucking silver spheres that drilled out a dude's face and he still is taking the fight to tall man. He is still willing to go out on his own and to leave people behind and to sneak out and be this one man army against this seemingly unstoppable foe. And so especially that first film where he's a young kid, just such a heroic character. And as you see the character develop, I mean, that only kind of gets compounded for the most part. Not so much in three. He's a little whiny in three. But two, even though we get a recast, he's a great character. Him and Reggie on the road taking on the, the tall man head on. And it's one of those rivalries where I, I just love the foil that these two characters have. This giant, hulking, sinister evil terrifying force that is slowly going to eat the world and the one thing that can stand in his way is this young child with a give no fucks attitude so mike always been one of my favorites if you have not seen the phantasm franchise i encourage you to at least check out the first two most people are iffy on the first one it's more mind bendy it's more trippy it's a little bit nondescript with what's going on the second one especially is the one that i tell everybody that's probably going to be your favorite that's the one that is more mass appeal that's the one that's a little bit more made for general audiences so i encourage you to check them out and if you're brave you can continue on past two but 
just check out those first two. Do me that favor. Coming in at number three, we've got McCready from John Carpenter's The Thing. And what's interesting about McCready, aside from the fact that Kurt Russell is playing him and so you expect a lot of the character for the casting alone, his role within this Antarctic outpost as the helicopter pilot is not one that you would expect to be the character to rise up to be the leader of this situation. You know, most of the time he's just there to commute back and forth if somebody needs him. If you don't need him, he'll be up in his shack getting fucking wasted, playing a stupid little chess game with his bitch ass computer and, uh, you know, leaving little tape recordings and stuff. But he's very much kind of on the outskirts of this group where you see these other characters in the first act that seem like they would rise to that occasion much quicker, namely Child, just because of his, his attitude. But uh, McCready even keeps that in check. But all throughout this film, as the, the thing arrives and you start to see all these sinister things happen and people morphing and dead bodies showing up, McCready is the one from the beginning that holds the whole situation together, that brings people together, that holds on to his rationale among the paranoia that is seeping into everybody's conscious. And he's the one that slowly starts to figure out how the thing works, how they can figure out who the thing is with the blood test scene, one of the greatest scenes in horror history. And by the end of it, how to take the fight directly to the thing. And even if it costs them their lives and probably will, we've got to extinguish this thing. We have got to vanquish this evil or the world is fucked. And he seems like okay with that from the beginning. There's never a point where he's like, well, damn, I kind of like living. He's like, no, nope, fuck it. If I got to die, I got to die. Of course, Kurt Russell's performance and his personality and his on-screen just charm brings a lot to the character, but that character arc in and of itself is enough to get McCready very high on this list. And I just absolutely love that movie and his character. And if you want to count Childs as one of the final guys, I guess you can. But like I said earlier, he's, he's one of those ones that are absent from the climax of the film. And really only his reemergence is there in the film to create that last little bit of paranoia in McCready and the audience to where to this day, people still debate and argue with which one of those characters is the thing, are both of them the thing, are none of them the thing. It's something that we still look for hints and clues and Easter eggs for. So one of the greatest films of all time, McCready, a large reason why. Coming in at number two, you knew it was gonna be on this list somewhere, and that is Andy Barkley from the Child's Play franchise. My longtime viewers know that Child's Play and Nightmare on Elm Street are my two favorite horror franchises of all time. Andy Barkley is one of the best characters, uh, maybe the best character that is not named Chucky in the Chucky franchise. And especially, much like with Mike in the first film, he's this young kid, even younger than Mike. He's a child, he's a literal baby and he is put in this situation where this serial killer embodying this doll is trying to not only kill everybody around him that gets in his way or annoys him or just for the fuck of it but he's trying to use Andy's body as a vessel he's trying to basically extinguish his soul and put his own in there and the way that this kid is so helpless the entire first film predominantly he's Physically can't do shit to stop the situation, much like with uh, Charlie Brewster and with Mike. Nobody around him believes him. And uniquely to the Child's Play franchise, every single time that bodies start to drop around Andy, everybody diverts all of their suspicion to Andy. So he not only has to protect himself and try to survive against the, the impending evil and the impending doom of Chucky, he also has to protect himself from everybody else around him who starts to have that little stink eye towards him, like, this might be a little murderous fucker trying to pull a fast one on all of us saying it's the damn doll. And I like the way that the character progresses and matures in the first three films. I know they recast in the third film. A lot of people aren't big fans of that, but I love Child's Play 3. So even in that one, when he has to switch to the role of protector, and he has since kind of embodied the role of protector from Cult of Chucky into the TV series, where Chucky is not really pursuing him anymore. Chucky is not having all of his plans focused on Andy. Andy is safe. He can go live his life if he wants to, but he doesn't take solace in his safety. He just kind of lives in his trauma and tries to use what he has learned and use his experiences to help other people that are now in the situation that he was when he was a kid. So great character. I love the way that he's continued to develop all throughout this franchise and continues to be developed to this day, which is a rarity, especially in horror, and 
He's my number two. But coming in at number one, I don't know what self-respecting final guy list would not have Ash Williams from Evil Dead at number one. And look, admittedly, Evil Dead, great franchise, consistently good, all five films, and I look forward to them every single time. It's nowhere near things like Child's Play if I was to rank my favorite horror franchises. But Ash... That's the quintessential final guy. If you look up final guy in the dictionary or on Google, you're immediately going to see Bruce Campbell's face because he just kind of set the standard for what a badass final guy can be, both physically with the attitude and the personality and the one-liners, the, the iconic weapons. I mean, check, check, check. Everything that you would want a badass final guy to be, he pretty much has it in spades and has continued to have it in spades every time this character has popped up in the first three films and the three seasons of the television show. And I'm not completely convinced that it's the last that we've seen of Ash as well. So now that we're going to be getting reportedly an Evil Dead film every two to three years instead of every 10 years, I think we'll probably see Ash Williams pop back up, if nothing else being like a mentor role. But I don't believe you, Bruce. We're going to see you again. But yeah, the, the same with the, the way that the character develops in the first three films is very similar to Andy, where he just happens to be the survivor in this situation in the first one. By the second one, he is taking the fight to the deadites. He's got the sawed off hand that he replaces with a, a chainsaw. He's got the boomstick. Third film, he might as well be a comic book hero at that point with the way that his character's costume is, with the ripped shirt, you can see his abs and shit coming through, especially in the artwork of the cover of the movie. He's arranging entire armies to take on all of these supernatural medieval villains. He's just a badass character. He's a fun character. He pretty much goes the full spectrum of what you would want, what you would ask for in a horror character. And there's no question why even if you're not overly familiar with the Evil Dead films, you'll recognize the character of Ash Williams because he is easily the most iconic final guy of all time. And he has to be my number one. Groovy. Well, that's it for this one, guys. If you enjoyed that, click over here for all my 2024 new release reviews. And I'm also gonna put my Final Girl tier list ranking up here as well. There's like 30, 35 Final Girls, so a big video. Please check that out if you're a fan of horror. Like, share, hit that subscribe button, and be sure to check out Aura, my sponsor, down in the video description below so you can surf the internet safely. And as always, remember, opinions are like assholes, but that doesn't mean you have to be.